uh, skipped a lot of slides, and so I'm just going to hit the high points. Uh, but if you got questions, go ahead and ask them. We'll do the same as we did yesterday, and if we don't finish, that's, I'd like to get to some of the later stuff because... Um, dealt with yesterday um, but with graphics and movies um, so I'm gonna go through just some basics most of you probably have a pretty good idea about how to deal with these sorts of things but there's a lot of terminology about the basic movements and uh, 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 I'll just go through them um, uh, an invagination um, or evagination depending on whether it goes in or out with reference to the embryo is a simple bending of a cell sheet and it's very often portrayed in sectional view like this, which uh, doesn't really give you a sense of it. And it usually involves some sort of cell shape change at uh, both the edges or uh, uh, on the inside. Um, <clears throat> and this is a very old term, which is one of the first movements described back in the, in the day. Um, and involution is somewhat different. Uh, very often, uh, these two are confused. But uh, uh, in terms of the kinematics, they're quite different. An involution is a tissue rolling around an inflection point, much like a bulldozer tread rolls around uh, the front wheel of a bulldozer. Um, and um, uh, basically takes the tissue on the outside and moves it in. And you saw that in the movie the other day. And so the initial thing that you saw in the movie of the frog was a little bending or uh, 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 depression formation and then uh, material rolled around a corner like this. Another is epithelial and mesenchymal transitions and ingression. Um, these two terms are, are often used uh, together. Uh, and usually they start off as an invagination the epithelium bends as the cells become bottle-shaped or wedge-shaped, which causes the bending of the epithelium, and then they de-adhere and crawl inside. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works uh, in several organisms in a minute. Um, <clears throat> convergent extension and convergent thickening. These are two uh, terms uh, that uh, this one arose in the 40s, and basically what it means is convergent extension means narrowing of a tissue and lengthening in, the, in, a, in another direction. Convergent thickening is narrowing of a tissue and thickening. Now you probably realize this is just convention um, it, with reference to uh, an embryonic axis because it's, it, you know, it, it, this could be, uh, this is convergent extension in the other direction. And so a lot of people, a lot of developmental biologists set these things up as icons and they get very uh, uh, concerned about it, about how they're related and whatnot, but uh, it, uh, you understand the geometry and it's just convention that it's called convergent thickening or convergent extension. And this is an example uh, that we'll talk about today. Uh, convergent thickening, a tissue th um, narrows and it thickens in this direction, which is the radio axis of the embryo, um, and then it will um, narrow and continue to narrow and it actually thins and extends. Um, so there are various sorts of uh, behaviors like that. This is an old one, epiboly. It means spreading. And there are several, you can have the cells divide and get thinner. They can just get thinner to make a larger area or in many cases they'll intercalate and sometimes you get intercalation of just the mesenchymal cells and the epithelial cells flatten and spread um, and in some cases divide and you get all combinations of those things and then occasionally such as in the uridial amphibians the animal pole for example um, you'll have mesenchymal cells intercalating into an epithelial sheet and I just want to add something about epithelial sheets here um, it was once thought that that junctional complex made them non-modal. And at the apical surface, they are non-modal, um, in, in a sense, um, because they ordinarily don't show protrusive activity, uh, but they can move around. And I'll show you a junctional remodeling plan for how they can intercalate. Those junctions do not mean that they can't slide by one another. Um, this is a very common misconception that epithelial sheets are stable. Uh, J.P. Trinkus, the guy that wrote that book that I told you about yesterday, the orange one, he and I made, back in 78, I made movies of a frog and showed that these epithelial cells could actually slide by one another. 
and that's an electrically that's that's a, a, a high resistance barrier physiological barrier but they still slide by one another and then Trink and I looked at the fish the um, fungulus embryo it has an enveloping layer that comes down over the yolk um, in development and it's an estuarine fish it can be in crystalline salt water or distilled water. You can take it and throw it in a, 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 a concentrated salt solution. It's fine. You can take it out and dump it in distilled water. Still fine. It is, it, it's the highest resistance epithelium known um, 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 uh, to biology. Those cells, uh, they're only half micrometer thick and we managed to film them with old cine film and they slide by one another and the electrical resistance, and they never, they, they don't leak. Um, so somehow these junctions in an epithelium are, uh, uh, can do these things. They can allow the cells to slide around within the plane and cells can insert. In fact, this is how the cilia, ciliated cells, the multiciliated cells generally get into an epithelium. They're actually born in a deep layer and then they insert themselves at triple cell junctions. Um, you have combinations of these things. Sometimes you have an invagination, but at the edges of it, it will roll over the lip. Um, um, you, uh, the kinematics of this is important if you're actually gonna figure out how it works because these things mechanically are not the same thing at all. Just a simple bending versus a bending and a rolling. Um, involution is something that's a very comp it's a compound movement. Um, in the frog, you looked at this lip, it was advancing over the yolk plug. Uh, it's made up of a bunch of components. The neural plate here is extending very rapidly. Um, this region here rolls over the lip. The post-involution, it's converging and extending, and then it's being taken up here by directed migration. So the combination of these, you'll see some, in some animals, this would be stable here with these rates matched up such that their lip doesn't advance, and then all of a sudden it'll start moving because one of these things has changed. And so you, you, it's... it's um, there are lots of variations in, sometimes the lip will actually retract in some organisms as the uh, push toward it. Uh, uh, so you, you can have all sorts of combinations. And then there's one thing that you folks are sophisticated about, but generally developmental biologists aren't, and that is out of plane sorts of things. They tend to represent things like this and uh, in, in, in a, a very simple view, but very often they're out of plane processes going on. And remember I talked about squeezing the blastopore shut. These cells that are intercalating are actually anchored in the endoderm here and they form arcs. Whenever they, the onset of this convergent extension, uh, it actually occurs progressively back like this. And so as the convergent extension, as these cells intercalate back toward this lip, right here is where the hoop stress is. And so it tends to whip this thing around like that, and then on the outside, there's something called convergent thickening that we'll talk about that uh, 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 causes this arc here, right outside the lip, to get thicker, um, feed cells into this whole process. So these out of plane sorts of things, are, there are a number of them that I'll talk about today. Um, so why I'm as such a church lady, as I said yesterday, about the kinematics of these sorts of things, um, well, uh, a detailed understanding of the movements tends to reveal, suggest or reveal potential mechanisms. And it's very hard to test mechanisms in developmental biology. So you want one to test that's real. I mean, that there's a pot got a possibility of working. And so finding out what is moving, the description is a big part of it. Um, and it very often, if you know how things move, it reveals unanticipated or counterintuitive uh, 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 geometries of cell behavior, possibilities for cell behavior and force generation. And it, it, all of this should reveal what I'm after out of these sorts of things as relevant hypotheses. Getting a good question to ask in morphogenesis is one of the keys because you're going to waste a lot of time testing something and then very often the embryo will slap you in the face and say well you idiot you know I, I gave you an answer and it doesn't mean a thing you know you, you, you can do you can spend years doing the wrong thing this is an example this is a really delusional aspect of the way invaginations are usually presented to students if this is actually what happens in most invaginations it's a disc and it goes into a cylinder. 
And if you try that, the demo that I usually do for my students is I take a piece of paper after they think that this is a good way to look at it. And I push my finger up through it like that and fold it down and I draw a ring around it and I unfold it and show them where the marks are. And then the circle that I drew on the outside of it only takes up a little bit of piece of it because each of these successive rings here has to get a lot smaller. And this is a common way of driving the whole process is to generate a hoop stress by either intercalating the cells or something else. Now very often developmental biologists tend to think about these things as icons. They get it in their head that um, if they see a certain combination of shapes or something, then it always is going to be like that. But it's not. Um, you have to really look at the thing as a machine. And we looked at that little groove that formed here yesterday and then it gets much deeper as things turn in. Well, what's actually happening here is a combination of a bunch of things. This vegetal region here shrinks. It's contracting this way at this vegetal end. And there's an upwelling of tissue here that rolls the entire inside around into the blastocele, which is behind this big uh, mass of endoderm here. And then it rolls against the roof of the blastocele here, and then it begins the directed migration across the roof. But what actually, this initial bending here is a function of these epithelial cells changing shape. Um, but only that little shallow groove actually is generated by that shape change in these bottle cells. What happens then is these things stick tight to these cells here, and they're dragged up inside, and then later on they respread. But most of the depth of the arc interron, as I said yesterday, if you put your hand right there, this lip will roll across your arm. And so the depth of the arc interron is actually generated by things moving back. And you wouldn't believe it took me 15 years to get this concept across to the developmental biology community. Um, and there's actually some mistakes in a textbook where this layer was jumping, the color of this layer was jumping across to this surface. So you really, when you're dealing with developmental biologists, you really have to watch carefully what they're saying to you because it might be wrong. And so if you're going to invest in time into modeling or physical measurements, find out really what the hell is moving where. Um, I'll say a little bit about directed migration right here because I won't have time later. Uh, when these cells turn inside, they migrate directionally on this roof. And if you put this roof down on a substrate, it will condition the substrate with fibronectin. And that will guide these cells directionally. But it's not the fibronectin that is the key thing. And Rudy Winklebauer, Noggle and Winklebauer, um, uh, it, the reference is not on here, but it will be on your, the copy of this that you get in another place. Um, uh, Noggle and Winklebauer showed that there's an FGF signal that comes up through this layer and polarizes this sheet. And one of the results of that polarization is there is a PDG, PDGF is made by these a PDGFA is made by these cells and secreted, and it's bound to a fibronectin matrix in here. The message is actually graded from low here to high up here. And so there's more of it up here than down here in terms of message. We don't know about the protein. These cells have the receptor, and they, the, uh, they will migrate as a slug um, in any case, in anything you put it on, but they will only go to the animal cap in a highly directional fashion following this PDGF gradient. To make matters more complicated, that the binding, there's a region in the PDGF that binds it to the extracellular matrix. There's another version of this thing, a splicing variant of this that doesn't have the matrix binding region. It's secreted. And so what the hell is it doing there? Well, it, a recent paper out of Winklebauer's lab, it's secreted here and it, it looks like it makes a gradient across through the, this array this way and, and stimulates a radial intercalation where these cells back here tend to intercalate the head toward this surface and spread these apart. Thus, there's actually a radial intercalation and a spreading as these things migrate. Now, to, to make uh, matters more interesting in, in, in terms of Jeff's talk to you yesterday, these things actually do a very good job of marching like a column of troops. And one of the things that, that, that we, we haven't been able to figure out how they shingle like this, um, but uh, recently, uh, there's a Weber 
W-E-B-E-R, Weber et al. paper out of Doug D. Simone's lab, D-E, capital S-I-M-O-N-E, he's a colleague of mine. And what they showed is these are cadherin junctions back here with the other cells. And so when this cell moves forward, it's going to be, it's going to, it's connected to these cells behind. And so as it moves forward, it's going to feel some pull tugging from the back simply because it's moving forward. So they did an ingenious experiment. They take a probe with a bead on it coated with cadherins and they get this cell out in a culture dish. And if they come up, up on the back side of it and let it adhere and tug on it, it will make a protrusion on the other side. And so it looks like what the reason that they all follow suit here as this one moves forward, it's tugged on the rear and that reinforces this, uh, this protrusive activity. And there are complications to this model, of course, because then this cell is being tugged on the front. Um, uh, so what exactly that does is not clear. But the idea is that there would be tension across this thing and each successive cell would be stimulated to migrate in that way simply because uh, its rear end is attached. So to make a long story short, there's a lot going on here. This is sort of a composite movement. Now, a lot of these morph morphogenic movements, it's how they're connected that counts. You have an intrinsic behavior, but what you get out of it is how you hook it up to other things. And in this invagination here, um, a key part of it, of this wedging here, uh, it results in pulling this marginal zone down a lot more than it deforms this vegetal region. And this vegetal region here is made out of large cells and it's very stiff. So when this contraction occurs, it's anisotropic. Most of it is in this direction. And it, 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 this region up here is pulled down this way as the apical constriction occurs. And if you uh, isolate these cells, as we'll do in a minute, the intrinsic contraction of these cells is actually uniform, but the environment is asymmetric. So that's why you get this tissue, which is uh, easy to move, um, moving down as opposed to this going up. And so if you isolate the bottle cell region here and let the cells form, they form as circles rather than as um, elongate um, apices. Here's a diagram of it. Here's what's happening. You get apical constriction and wedging, and you get the bending of the epithelium. Um, this is what happens in vivo. You isolate it, it's symmetric. And with, what that does is, is it gives you a tremendous amount of movement of the marginal zone. And pretty much any morphogenic movement is like this. It's the mechanical context that counts. And so you'll get all sorts, we'll talk some more about this in a minute. Now, I won't go through this. This is pretty, uh, you'll get the references, but basically this is an actin myosin contraction that we've actually added to this. It's myosin 2A, an isoform, particular isoform of myosin. Um, and also microtubules are necessary for a number of, of issues in generating this shape. And surprisingly, um, uh, I ordinarily wouldn't have thought about this. I didn't for many years, but when these things contract, they're going to go down to way less than 20 micrometers. And the membrane in the apex goes into a forest of microvillar, or actually microfolds. But also, that membrane is endocytosed, taken up into the cell, as shown by a paper out of uh, uh, Jen Lee and Richard Harlan. And if you block endocytosis, the cell shape change will not go to completion. And so this is one of the things, just housekeeping things about the cells. They actually have to engineer a lot of stuff to do this. It's not just some sort of thing where you can get a simple contraction. You got to get rid of the membrane. And then when the thing respreads later on, maybe it's reinserted. People haven't shown that, but it's a lot of membrane handling. And so uh, a blocking just uh, 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 something like that can uh, foul up the whole works. This, years ago when we looked at this uh, uh, and, and, and other types of, 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 of uh, apical constrictions, basically if these apices constrict and there's no resistance to apical basal elongation, you get a palisading. And you very often get that before you get the wedging and bending. Um, 
And then, so there's two ways it can happen. If you get this apical constriction, when there's a lot of resistance to apical basal elongation, the apical constriction and the wedging occur simultaneously. Um, but in other cases, you'll get the apical constriction, constriction and the palisading, and then they draw their butts down toward their apices here, their bases toward their apices, and bend as all the cytoplasm is wedged into a small space. And so you get, this happens in the neural plate, in the ascidian, and a number in the fly. Um, if you cut these things out, it's, what happens is they'll whip around. If you cut those bottle cells around out, this thing, the, you get an extreme shortening. This thing is preloaded either by an active contraction or elastic uh, uh, elements in the cell. And if you cut these things out very, very rapidly in a matter of seconds, they'll start to whip around like that. Um, and they'll become extremely rotund. So, yes? So the line colored uh, purple, mm -hmm. are there like cortex of actins yes. and myosin contractions? Yes. And I won't be able to talk too much about it. I'll say something about it. But it, it's, there are a bunch of molecules responsible for recruiting things to that apex. Um, uh, some recruit actin, like shroom. Three, I think it is, recruits actin there. Um, there uh, I'll talk a little bit about it when we get to Drosophila. Um, rho is essential to get myosins there and myosin working there. Um, different myosins in different systems. Um, and I'll show you an example where this is anisotropic. You actually get the contractile apparatus on particular sides of the cell. Um, now, there are two, actually while I'm on that subject, epithelial cells, the Oribi um, uh, had some classic papers in cell biology where they showed that there was a purse string around the edge. And it, when it squeezes, the top bulges up a little bit. Almost all the embryonic versions of this, it's not a purse string around the edge. That was sort of an artifact of it being a, a, a tissue culture cell, a tissue cell. In general, in embryos, it's a mat of actin. And as the thing contracts, it's reorganized. It's a, it's a, and it, there's a whole uh, a cycle of recruitment of myosin and actin arrays, a contraction, and then a holding function and actually downstream of two different transcription factors, snail and twist, is regulated the contraction and the holding function. So they're actually separate under separate transcriptional control upstream. So it's a really sophisticated machine. Uh, I, I probably won't get to that, but um, uh, 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 it will be in, in, the, in this show. I just don't have the slide open. Um, a good paper to check about this is a, a Kristen Sherrard and Ed Monroe. He's at Chicago. They're both at Chicago now, University of Chicago. This is an ascidian embryo. And uh, I'll just summarize what they did. This is a fairly clear embryo, and you can image it pretty well. And so the, ecto uh, the uh, ectoderm up here um, actually shortens here and flattens to make a greater area, um, while the uh, mesendoderm here uh, undergoes an apical constriction that first simply elongates these cells. And the red here is the surfaces of cells that have a phosphorylated myosin on serine 19. But it can be doubly phosphorylated on another uh, amino acid nearby. And that's shown in, in blue here. And uh, there are differences between the dynamics of the one phosphorylated and two phosphorylated myosins. So after this apical constriction occurs, then uh, you get the, um, the um, uh, bases here sucked down, pulled down toward uh, the, uh, the apices. But since these are all glued to the, the ectoderm up here, you get an invagination. So this is a, that one of those two-step processes. He did a lot of modeling. They did a lot of modeling and microsurgery to establish exactly what the mechanics are about this whole system. It's a very... So this... Uh, my point here is, the point of this paper is, that what I told you before about that two-step process and the apical basal resistance, it looks like it's, there's independent regulation. I mean, there's, it's, it's two aspects uh, 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 of, the, of the cytoskeleton that are involved here in apical basal resistance to elongation or contraction.
and apical constriction. This is a fly embryo, and the way the fly makes uh, mesoderm, it has, it's cylindrical, uh, it makes a, 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 an embryo in sort of an odd way uh, in that it uh, divides all the nuclei, they came, come out to the surface of this yolky ellipsoid, and then they're cellularized all at the same time to form a bunch of cells, and then an invagination happens um, to make a groove, and then the lips of the groove fuse, and you internalize mesoderm. And here you see it, and these pictures go from here to here across. And so you see they're beginning to apically constrict here, and uh, they're wedging out. You can see them pushing out against the surface here uh, more, and they elongate somewhat um, as they do so, and then they start to shorten, and they cause the invagination, it gets deeper, they eventually fuse here, and then they undergo epithelium mesenchymal transition and crawl away. So this is another example of the two-step method. And I won't go through all this, but this is, the, 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 they've been able to work using genetics. They've been able to work out, uh, a number of people have contributed to this, they've been able to work out um, the uh, uh, signaling cascade involved in this. Um, and it involves coordination, a receptor that gets these things coordinated to where they contract in a, in a certain, at, at the same time. There's a couple of phases to it, and it's downstream of the transcription factors twist, which are, these two are very often involved in epithelial mesenchymal transitions, like in the neural crest, for example. Um, and um, a, a, a heterotrimeric G protein, downstream of this uh, uh, receptor, which uh, they probably have identified by now. Um, that feeds into a row GAF and rho, which uh, 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 a downstream of rho, it's not on here, but rho kinase phosphorylates myosin, and it inhibits a phosphatase that dephosphorylates myosin. And so that's how you get the myosin activated. But this cascade is also necessary for apical localization. So the same pathway, but probably some diversity downstream here, is essential to get the myosin concentrated on the apices. Um, snail uh, uh, turns on twist, uh, twist turns on snail, um, and it represses E cadherin, which causes these cells eventually to deadhere and crawl away. So that's um, uh, there's a lot to that. Um, I'll just add one more thing. Um, that cascade from twist down and then snail the other way. Um, um, Adam Martin in Eric Bischaus's lab has just recently shown how these cells contract. So they periodically contract and then they hold and then they'll contract again and hold. And if you uh, perturb snail, I forget which it is now, I think snail is involved in the holding. What happens is if you knock down snail, the uh, contraction occurs, but then it relaxes, occurs and relaxes to a certain extent. Uh, whereas if you, if, if you compromise twist, you get less of a contraction, but it, it holds. So there, uh, it, it's quite interesting, you know, we don't know what's between twist and snail. But in the old days, we wouldn't have thought that you'd go way back up in a transcriptional, uh, up, upstream transcriptional regulation to build machinery for just the contraction and the holding. My point is that these are very sophisticated machines, and we don't know why they do these sorts of things, but there's probably a mechanical reason. We don't know why the, the, you have two modes of contraction, uh, apical constriction, with the bending, with the wedging and bending in some cases, and then they're out of phase in the other, where you get a constriction, elongation, and then you pull the base down. It could be, just be happenstance. Um, sea urchin invagination. Um, the epithelium of the vegetal plate bends in and it forms the gut, and while that happens, these primary mesenchyme cells crawl out of this basal this vegetal plate here. It's a monolayered epithelium. It's got matrix on the outside. Um, and these mesenchyme cells, they'll crawl around and make the skeleton, which I haven't shown here. But then partway through this, 
um, the secondary mesenchyme cells pop out of the tip of this thing and in the classic work by Gustafson and Wolpert, they extend protrusions up to the animal cap. And in those days, they thought that these, these uh, uh, protrusions grabbed a hole of the roof here and pulled on the roof to tow this thing up, stretch it up to make a full length gut. Um, this first step here, and this is a classic sort of experiment that embryologists do, just isolate a piece and see if it will do it on its own. And this initial first phase of invagination is autonomous to the vegetal plate. Um, these kinds of experiments, if you get a positive result, it means something. If you get a negative result, it doesn't mean anything. Because anytime you break the embryo open and don't get something, uh, you basically don't have an experiment. Uh, you've got uh, uh, because the conditions can always be such that it won't happen. The second phase um, is actually two phases. And Jeff Harden in my lab back in, in, uh, in Berkeley uh, zapped these cells with a laser, uh, the secondary mesenchyme cells, so they couldn't put out these protrusions. And it turns out that there's a middle third of this process that's autonomous. And it's driven by an active cell intercalation to form a longer, narrower cylinder. Um, it, but it stalls out at that point. So you've got an autonomous initial invagination. You've got, then you've got uh, a, an independent autonomous elongation by cell intercalation. And then finally, the last phase, at least in this species, requires the towing of these philopodia and pulling on the roof. Uh, Jeff Harden did some finite element modeling of this to show that him and uh, um, uh, um, a, a colleague of his uh, graduate student back there to show basically that's how we got started on doing these ex experiments because they showed that this this mechanism probably wasn't completely um, accurate. Now I'm going to rush through some things here. Lance Davidson's coming uh, down the line here a little bit but uh, what I want to uh, point out here is he did some work that showed that there are many potential me mechanisms of invagination and, we're, and a lot of them are cropping up now in various systems. This thing is a, is a monolayer, a very clear, most of them are very clear and at the vegetal plate here it first thickens and it does that invagination and then, um, but if you look at this entire uh, array here, the way it's built, you've got epithelial cells that are tight junction to one another. Um, but or adherence junctions to one another, but they have microvilli that extend through a matrix that consists of two layers, an apical lamina that has some specialized things called fibropellins in it, and then you get a hyaline layer uh, on the outside, and these things stick up through this matrix. And this combination of, of cell and two layers of matrix is quite interesting. So what Lance did was he made some finite element models of this and experimentally tested some mechanisms that were thought to be to happen. And uh, I won't go through it in any detail. The point is that there are a lot of uh, models that work to cause an invagination. And uh, he, he, under certain conditions, what I'm showing here is conditions of the finite element model that work for this particular mechanism, apical constriction and basal expansion, apical basal shortening, both work under some conditions. As you pull the cell down like this, it's going to uh, occupy more area and it's attached to this matrix, so it's going to make a, a bimetallic strip sort of bending thing, mimic. Um, cell tractoring. This was a novel thing proposed by Burke at Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, at the university there. Uh, he thought he saw protrusive activity in a circle here, being all of them being directed inward, which could potentially buckle this thing inward. And we didn't think this thing would work, but there are conditions of matrix stiffness where it will work. Uh, with pretty physiological uh, 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 forces for the uh, um, uh, center uh, 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 movement there. Gel swelling. This one is one that actually works. Connie Lane, uh, back in my lab at Berkeley uh, with Fred Wilt, uh, showed that this actually works. Uh, what happens is she found that there's a proteoglycan made by these cells and it's secreted into the inner layer of this matrix. Um, um, and it swells and it bends the sheet. And you can make a, you could, a particular uh, uh, matrix uh, stiffness um, 
uh, it, you can get bending. And in fact, experimentally, you can get bending. You can make, hit these things with cytoclase and then completely dissociate the cells. As long as they can secrete, it will bend the sheet. Um, but if you block secretion of this proteoglycan, it won't invaginate. The last one was one that Lance just dreamed up, and that is a band of transcellular cytoskeletal elements forming a hoop stress around this thing, and under certain conditions it will work. And it turns out that this thing is, is probably very common. We've got several cases where we think that this is happening. One in sacroglossus, a, a protochordate, um, where you've got a constriction hoop like this. Anyway, you could check out this paper. He might talk about this, uh, but I doubt it. He's got a lot of new stuff. But uh, uh, basically, he took all these models, and uh, uh, what you see here is all the models under three different conditions. And he picked these three different conditions because uh, all the, uh, in these, one or the other of these three conditions, all these models work. And he mapped out a parameter space uh, for each, um, e each mechanism using uh, pretty physiological ideas about how much force could be generated by various processes. And then just looking at the varying the elastic modulus of the um, um, apical lamina and the hyaline layer. Uh, and, I think this is, this is a very interesting approach is there, there, to figure out. One of the things that is interesting is that you can, there's, you can go from one of these mechanisms. A lot of them will work across the same, in the same region. So in terms of evolution, you could easily go from one of these to another. There are some jumps that might be, have to be pretty catastrophic. Um, there's a... A paper out of um, Sasai's lab uh, that has to do mostly with ES cells. What he does, but it turns out that he that is, has some interesting aspects to it morphogenetically. Um, he uh, d does a concoction of growth factors and matrix to make epiblast uh, expression as epiblast markers, and he got them to make brain markers. And he finally got these vesicles that uh, will make these little bulges out to the side, which express. Um, uh, um, uh, neural retina markers and under certain conditions they'll go right on ahead and differentiate into an optic vesicle and an optic cup and so then the next thing that happens is that you get a ret pigmented, retinal pigmented epithelium formed and um, then the thing will invaginate. What you see here is phosphorylated myosin like chain um, and with um, uh, uh, an AFM, they showed that this cup, any place that this uh, myosin was upregulated, the my, re, reg, uh, regulator of the myosin activity, was stiff. Um, whereas the end of it here was not. And so you got a cup that's stiff in the end that is floppy and it sort of flattens like this. And then you get apical constriction at the boundary of these two, and you get a, a bending in, a wedging. And it, it just sort of cups us in just a little bit. And then you get a period of growth. And what's interesting is that this whole thing here is rho kinase dependent. Um, downstream of rho, rho kinase to myosin. Uh, all these phases are, and they're cytoskeleton dependent. This one isn't cytoskeletal dependent. It's dependent upon growth. And if you block uh, cell division and growth, you wind up, but this process fails. This is the best example I know of growth pressure, which is an ancient idea that goes all the way back to Wilhelm Heese in the 1800s. Uh, I won't say much about this, but it's fascinating. Uh, Hallman, um, check out this paper. Volvox, normally there's a hole appears here and then it turns inside out by ch cell shape change. And what's interesting is that the, they maximize their utility in generating force here by moving the bridges between the cells. These cytoplasmic bridges um, are moved in all cases of inversion. But in this particular species, it shows type B in which there's no hole appears. What happens is you get a bending mid-body here at mid-level and it actually rolls this end into this end and then it forms a hole up here and wraps this on around to the inside. Check out this because there are lots of variations. And one of the points that I'm, I wanted to emphasize here is these are progressive events. These cell shape changes sweep across as a wave through 
the, the tissue. And the wave goes in different directions in different species. Marvelous system. And then we wrote a little uh, news and views thing on, on this. Neurulation. Um, and I'm going to talk about a classic paper here just briefly. Out of uh, Anton Jake. This is a this is a classic paper. Um, he's at Texas, and he sort of pioneered um, a, a lot of the ideas that the rest of us then took up. Um, I mentioned him because he was the cold hard spear point back in the days when people didn't want to see mechanics in developmental biology, and he was the point man, so to speak. Um, or one of them, and probably the most prominent. This is what a neural plate does initially it, an, a, in, in an embryo. And you've seen this in that movie I showed you. It basically, first it makes it, the cells palisade um, and make a, 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 it shrinks in area and it begins to elongate. Um, but it's kind of a complicated movement, both elongation and shrinkage. And so what he did was, what Antone did was, he mapped the heights and uh, uh, made a map of height changes um, and apical area change, corresponding to apical area changes. And then he took a, a region from up here, a thick region, and put it in the thin region and found uh, uh, that as the animal developed, this local piece here, that height program was autonomous. If you move this up here, it doesn't, it, it, the height, it, it maintains its number two height change program here. And so that's an autonomous function. The other thing that is involved here is the notoplate. Underneath this is a notochord, and then the region above it is called the notoplate. And they extend, converge and extend together and force the elongation of this thing, or at least that was his hypothesis. So what he did, here's the fate map of what happens, and he did uh, one of the early computer uh, uh, computational models of these, this process. And so he, by putting in a particular height uh, change program, an area change, um, and the, uh, uh, the external force of elongation here, he could get something that mimicked the fate map. If he only put in the elongation, he didn't get the right thing. If he did only the shrinkage, he didn't get the right thing. And then he did an experiment of isolating the neural plate and it mimics this condition here where you don't have the elongation. And this was, this is probably not all great shakes today, but it, in those days, it really told us microsurgical manipulation, fate mapping, and thinking about the mechanics and bringing a computer uh, uh, model into it. Uh, that was sort of a pioneering paper in a lot of our minds. Uh, one question is, if you get apical constriction and it's in an isotropic environment, you should get a pit. And in very many cases you do. And others where you've got an external resistance, like in the frog, you get a groove. But what about the neural plate? Why does it, why does it shrink in the medial lateral direction, but not the length. Well, it turns out it's a fascinating story out of Takeichi's lab in uh, the Riken Institute. Here's what you, here's phosphorylated myosin. And you'll notice it's got this stripy look from medial to lateral. This is F-actin, and it sort of does too. And this is the junctions. And so if you put all this together, what you can see is that the phosphorylated mass and the actin tends to run along uh, junctions that are medial-lateral. Um, and so potentially when this stuff contracts, it make an anisotropic contraction. So they, they thought, well, if it's polarized, maybe the PCP pathway is involved. And this is Seltzer, the mammalian name for flamingo, the classic PCP cadherin that's anisotropically localized in a lot of polarized systems. And it has kind of a stripy medial lateral look too, where it's concentrated on the anterior and posterior sides of the cell, as opposed to the medial and lateral sides. And so it turns out what happens is, this is a cadherin that glues the cells together. And the PCP pathway uh, consists of a went ligand, which isn't in here, frizzled to seven transmembrane uh, 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 protein and it, it stimulates 
it, it acts through disheveled a cytoplasmic signaling protein. Um, and DAM1 to organize, but well, first of all, uh, Flamingo localizes this whole complex to the anterior and posterior sides of the cell um, and recruits uh, the uh, uh, rock, ro uh, the row, uh, the uh, rock enterprise up here to stimulate contraction. So, what you've got is a concentration of the contractile forces on the anterior and posterior sides such that you get wedging in this direction but not this direction. Fascinating story. That's been a problem uh, uh, lying about for a long time. Um, I can't really talk about this paper. I really don't have time, but it's an interesting paper. One, of the, I would, uh, You guys should read this and see if you see something weird about this paper. If you have a cylinder and you have cells contracting on it, wouldn't you expect that it would show the same differential of, of resistance that you get in like a water pipe? You know, when you've got a water pipe that explodes, it always rips along the length of the cylinder as opposed to around the circumference. Isn't the pressure inside of a tube twice around, it, it twice or, or so, much greater in the circumference than along the length? Thickness to radius ratio. Uh huh. But the pressure inside, I think, is the slip stress times the ratio of all thickness to radius. Check out this paper and see what you think. I, I really I can't talk about it. The one thing I will say here is that in germ band elongation, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, a bit, uh, after that invagination of the mesoderm uh, on the ventral side of the fly embryo, what you've ha just had here is the mesoderm's gone inside. And then the whole germ band, everything on the outside elongates and it pushes all the way around up here like this. Then later on it retracts. But in this germ band elongation phase, if you look at the ventral side, the cells intercalate with one another um, and make a pattern like this. If this is the, 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 the middle of the embryo here, they go in both directions. But basically that's just where you, whatever you pick is the reference point. So you get convergence and extension by epithelial cell rearrangement. Well, the bottom line on Lucy Butler's paper here is that they noticed that there was an early fast phase to this. And they perturbed some genes, AP patterning genes, that are essential for the cell intercalation. And they found that this early phase goes almost as good as it did with the cell intercalation. But the second phase doesn't. And so the bottom line is there's an early fast phase, a late slow phase. So slow phase. And then they found that the early fast phase actually also in, instead of just being cell intercalation, the cells were elongating and they weren't being compressed from the side, they were being stretched. And so then they perturbed both the cephalic furrow formation and mesoderm formation on the, in, the inside to ask the question. What are, those are the two other potential things that could be an ex, external force added to this. And they found out that it's probably the mesoderm. So the mesoderm goes in converges and extends and stretches the outside. But the fly people that are working on germ band elongation, they missed this all these years. Um, and a very careful study of intercalation, the intercalation uh, relative, the intercalation and the, and the um, uh, cell shape change uh, tipped these guys off that there was actually an external force. It's, a, it's quite an interesting paper, but uh, I don't have time to talk about it. Let's see once where we are here. We are at 923. I tell you what, um, does anybody have any questions about that storm or stuff? Um, about the invagination, uh, I'm wondering if it always takes place toward the tissue, I mean inside, or sometimes it would be happening outside. It goes both ways. So what's the difference in signaling pathway that mm -hmm. it happens to outward or into mm -hmm. the tissue? Um, generally, um, um, generally the, the apex is on the concave side. But I think there are probably cases where that's not true. Uh, there are some invaginating, evaginating systems where 
it's debatable just exactly what kind of condition, what the junctional condition and the polarity of the cells are. Uh, but the ones that have been studied as model systems, common model systems, it's usually the, it's the apical side that does the constricting. Um, but a lot of developmental biology is done on a limited set of systems because of their convenience. So there, I wouldn't want to say that, that it isn't reverse in some cases, but I don't know of one. And is it true to say that uh, EMT, in, I mean, if uh, evagination is out for, then uh, EMT is more activated? I mean, maybe the mesenchymal part forced the epithelial cells to go out for, or, no, it's not. Um, yeah, well, there are a lot of EMTs where you don't have the cells, that they leave in lots of different ways. And in some cases, they crawl and they actually tow the epithelium before they pull out of the epithelium. So there are all sorts of, there are all sorts of variants to it. Um, and most of them have not been explored that much. Um, any other questions? Um, I'd like to talk, yeah. Can you comment on what kind of imaging tools are used in uh, developmental <coughs> biology? Mm -hmm. Imaging tools? Uh -huh. you comment on that? Yep, yep. Um, we use confocal microscopy. We use epilumination. Uh, we, use, we use whatever gives us the image. I tell you what, if, if you'll let me go on for a bit, I'll show you some examples and tell you how we did it. Um, um, for clear animals, you can use uh, uh, a lot of different kinds of non-fluorescent contrast enhancement, things like phase or interference uh, contrast microscopy. But uh, generally these days, uh, fluorescence works the best, even in a clear animal, um, and, con and a sectional uh, uh, actually, my wife, uh, Ann Sutherland, she's doing mouse now, and uh, they've, they use, sometimes they use multi-photon, but just with the standard confocal, they can image, they can Z-series all the way through a mouse. And so what they do is they make these monster movies. Um, as many planes as they can get uh, and not kill the animal. And then they Take that they, they, they will run a movie watching a population of cells, and that when a, a cell goes out of that plane, they can't find it anymore. They go to the next plane, and then they'll trace it through that one. And so they can trace hundreds of cells doing this. It's laborious, but uh, uh, the mouse is fantastic material if you can know how to culture them. And so they're doing a lot of the stuff we've done now on the mouse. And that's that's that that uh, the, the, they occasionally use the multi photon for that because it's uh, it's less it's less um, uh, damage, and uh, but the images aren't quite as good. Right, that's that's the mouse embryo. So that would be what 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 length scale are we talking about? Um, it starts out quite small, about 600 micrometers long, I think, or no less than that, 300 or so. But it gets up, it's, it's probably over a millimeter at, at uh, eight days. Um, but the axis that they go through is a lot shorter. Uh, you have to roll these things around. The biggest, the biggest problem in imaging embryos is finding some way to hold them. And the mouse is particularly bad because it grows enormously. So you can't put it in a cage. Um, because it expands. And so what you have to do is you have to find a way to get in to the tissue that you want. And so they orient the embryo such that they can get the whole embryo with a very short focus, with a, a 1 4 numerical aperture objective or a high numerical aperture 20. They generally use like a real high numerical aperture 20x or 40x. Um, but um, you guys know all about that, but a lot of developmental biologists, you know, they 
I'll show you some cytoskeleton here. They try to image the cytoskeleton, and uh, they uh, they call us up. What did you do? And I say, well, what objective are you using? Oh, I'm using a a, a, a 40x or um, 100x or 60x or something. What's the numerical aperture? A lot of times they've got some cheap object objective, and you can you don't see anything you know so the numerical aperture is key and then being able to get the embryo in the right place to where and stable um, um, it's that's the, usually the big challenge you said if you were to the um, differences and common things between the castration and rocks uh, versus in um there are, the, the invagination is different, the, the mesoderm invagination is different from the frog only in that the frog does both the constriction and the wedging at the same time. It's got an inherent uh, uh, resistance to elongation. Uh, the fly, it's the two-phase model. Um, the convergent extension, which I'll talk about right now a little bit, um, is in an epithelium in the fly, whereas the driving force in the frog is um, um, mesenchymal cells. And the epithelium is passively towed along, stretched. Um, the frog does not do EMT, but the axolotl, the uridio embryo, Everyone we've looked at does an, a, a big EMT, and it's a force-producing EMT. Um, um, there are actually big differences between amphibians. The, the uh, uridial amphibian gastrulates more like a mouse. When you get right down to it, it's more like a mouse than it is like uh, an, a neuron-like xenopus. That's, I made that point the other day that morphogenic movements, the combination that these animals use, it's, it's, it's not conserved at all. The pathways are very similar. The row pathway, row A, uh, that, that, that row in Drosophila, the one that the uh, frogs use to activate myosin, is, the, is, is the, the most like that row in the fly. I mean, they're very similar rows. There are different kinds of rows. So they, a lot of the detail, snail and twist, they're involved in EMT in a mouse. They're involved in the EMT in gastrulation in the fly. So some of these signaling pathways are conserved. But the differences, um, uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of differences in how you put your players on the field. One of the points that, again, I want to make about morphogenesis is that um, and people are having a lot of trouble swallowing this um, um, if you've got if you're if you're if you're if you're modulating gene activities that affect physical and geometric patterning functions um, you're there the, the, that that process is going to fall into Lots of really cute, fantastic ways of doing things that are totally counterintuitive. And so in the old days, I had a lot of trouble with modelers because they'd always bring a particular mathematics that they wanted to use or a particular idea that they had in their head. Um, and it had to be this way because that's what they liked. And they said they thought it made sense. But the difference between physics and biology is that biology uses a lot of different machines um, because it can. And what is is what works. And so what you get is a huge diversity of machines that um, they all make sense. They all follow physical law. Um, but it's just that uh, now, now a lot of people who do computational models are getting used to the idea. Look at the bro, that's our short for embryo. In fact, there's even a, a rap song. Um, um, 
uh, uh, Jerry Thompson up at Stony Brook. He's a buddy of mine, and he's a rapper. He's a white guy, but he's a rapper. And he's, he has, he's got this rap, it's called, Who Put Yo in the Embryo? And it's really cool. So you got to look at the bro and see what it's doing. And then deal with, deal with what it presents to you. And you're going to have a really exciting life. Because it's going to bring a lot of machines to you that you, you probably wouldn't ordinarily have thought that... Uh, uh, I, I got another two hours worth of special machines that are just fantastic machines. Um, different ways of doing things. Gel swelling things, fiber round hydrostats, all kinds of, of toys that embryos use. Where's the most uh, elementary uh, uh, of desolation? Uh, <coughs> most like, it's what? What's the most primitive? You know, it's probably simple ingression. Uh, cells undergoing an EMT. Mesozoans start out as an epithelium. And then the gonad cells, the reproductive cells, crawl out of the epithelium on the inside. That's about the simplest organism that you can find. Now, it's not primitive because there's, you know, it's a modern animal. But that's about the simplest thing to make a multi-layered embryo. Basically, gastrulation, you want to get an outer shell that protects the innards, and then you've got to have at least reproductive cells on the inside. Uh, you could put them on the surface. Some organisms have them on the surface. Um, at least for part, for part of their bulwarks has it, uh, them on their surface for part of the, their life. Well, it's actually one layer. Um, um, but... Um, uh, that's about as simple as you can get. And then when you get beyond the diploblastic sort of organization where you've got two layers, in the three layers you make a gut out of endoderm and outer shell out of ectoderm. And there are some very simple uh, nematodes, for example. Gastrulation consists of, a, of, depending on the nematode, in some cases two or three cells crawl in. Uh, in uh, just ingress off the surface in a very subtle way. Look up Bob Goldstein's work at, uh, uh, he's at UNC, Robert Goldstein. Um, and in other cases, uh, there's uh, more cells. Uh, Schieren, Schierenberg in Germany, I think there's a guy by the name of Schierenberg, tall, lanky fellow. He does comparative nematode gastrulation. Uh, so nematodes are pretty simple, but that seems to be the uh, the about the you know simplest sort of thing. Um, any other questions? We have about less than twenty minutes. Uh, let me just hit a few high points here. I want to show you some. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase here and show you some movies. You're going to get this and so you can play with it uh, all you want. Um, all I ask, you can use the movies for teaching or, and the diagrams and everything. Uh, if you do, keep the credits with the image or the movie because my students, our movies are all over the place and sometimes people use them and they're no longer attached to the student who did it. Uh, you know, they and they feel a little funny about that. So I always ask people, if you're going to use our movies, keep my student's name with the movie and just put it at the bottom of the movie. Um, and you can go through this yourself. This whole business of cell intercalation, um, there, a lot of, org it's turned out to be ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, too numerous to mention. Um, this is what, how it works in the frog and mesenchymal cells. I'll talk about that in a minute, but it, it happens in the ascidian, teleos, germ band extension. Uh, I mentioned the sea urchin gut elongation, nematodes. You can look at this yourself. Hindgut. Signaling wise, there's only one thing that seems to be absolutely conserved. The signal always goes transverse to the axis of intercalation. And the pathway can be different. In this case, it, in, in the hindgut, it's um, um, unpaired and stat signaling. In Drosophila, germ band extension, 
it's stripes of uh, runt and even skipped and croupal. Um, in a frog, it's probably got a went or a nodal or a combination of them that runs AP. But um, uh, the PCP pathway, the planar cell polarity pathway is used in some systems and not others. Um, so you, uh, uh, again, it's one of these things, the machine, the biomechanics of the machine is similar. The uh, kinematics are similar. It can be in an epithelium, a mesenchyme, uh, but the, in this case, the signaling pathways involved actually have a, a bit of diversity. Let me just run through some things quickly. In epithelial cells in the germ band, um, when the cells rearrange, basically there's this type two, uh, uh, type one junctional rearrangement. Basically what happens is myosin is localized on the anterior and posterior surfaces. And supposedly, in laser ablation experiments, my, my, uh, nano dissection experiments where they slice this with a laser, uh, show that tension develops in this boundary and it's squeezed together like that and then they meet at a point and then, uh, or whatever, um, and then uh, they exchange neighbors. Why they exchange neighbors in this pattern uh, isn't really clear, but that's the junctional remodeling and that all up occurs up around the apex of the cell here, as far as they know. And then there's a variant of that. Uh, this, that was Lequis work, um, who's now back in France. Uh, Jen Zalin, who was in Bischaus's lab, uh, is now at uh, Sloan Kettering. If you get a lineup of cells where the myosin's localized along a long string of cells, you can get these rosettes, uh, which come together. And then when they resolve, they, re they rearrange such that they're in an anterior-posterior array instead of a medial-lateral array. And so both these mechanisms occur. Um, uh, Ann Sutherland and, and uh, Margot Williams back at, at, at uh, 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 Virginia, they've been doing this in ep mouse epithelial cells and it turns out to be quite different. Let me just run through quickly what happens in the frog. Um, so we talked about this already. Here's the animal. Um, there's a marginal zone here. Uh, the notochord turns inside and elongates and narrows. The mesoderm rolls in along both sides to form an axis that extends and converges. And that happens in all vertebrates that we know about. Uh, so it both squeezes as it converges around the blastopore and it lengthens as it elongates. And so what this is, if you take that dorsal lip out there and culture it as an explant, it will, it will do this in culture on agarose. So all the force necessary to do this is generated by the cells crawling on one another inside this piece of tissue. And you can uh, uh, put this thing in, back at Berkeley, we put this thing in something called a histo-wiggler where it had to push against an anvil, a force measuring machine uh, designed by uh, 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 Steve Moore, worked with Mimi Cole um, and, and me. And so uh, the thing will generate a pushing force and it also gets fourfold stiffer in the AP axis. So it shows an anisotropic stiffening in the AP axis, but not the medialateral. Uh, we've also done this now in the other direction. Medialaterally, it, 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 I'll get to it in just a second. In fact, I'll rush on along so that you can see it. So basically what these cells do is they polarize medialaterally, they b extend big protrusions medialaterally, they pull in from the sides, they compress the tissue, uh, it's self-compressed, and it squish in all directions, but then there's a radial intercalation shown over here, these green arrows that squeeze it from the other direction. So it's basically like dough. You push from the sides, and you push from the top and bottom, and you get something that elongates, like so. And if you look at the cells, they're bipolar, they exert traction on other cells, and on matrix, perhaps. Um, and there are myosins and a cortical act inside a skeleton. Um, and there's a fibronectin matrix actually on this side and on the side behind the board. Um, and this is what they look like. You've seen this. Here they are. You can see how they kind of nudge between one another. And this is it, 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 extremely efficient. If each of these guys just moves a cell diameter, the thing's gonna be twice as long and half as wide. And so not much happens locally here as you trace it, but uh, it, it has a tremendous effect on the tissue. It's a very powerful mechanism. 
And then if you look at it in high resolution uh, confocal microscopy, this is actually two planes colored differently. The green is deep, um, the uh, uh, red is on the surface, and uh, you can see the polarization. This is imaging. High contrast on background is what you want. So if you label all these cells, you can't see that protrusive activity. What you want to do is get a scatter label. And we, we sometimes graft them in. Sometimes we inject a small blastomere earlier, which then produces separated blastomeres. But you want to have unlabeled cells in the background here uh, with some label ones to get the cell behavior. Um, this epi-illumination, this is low angle epi-illumination shadowing. Um, and John Schur was the world's expert at this. He actually did this kind of stuff, imaged it with fluorescence with actually the first generation of fluorescent dyes back in the 80s. And then you're wondering about tissue dynamics. How can this thing be intercalating and yet be stiff when you push on it? There are these lateral protrusions that have a lifetime of about a minute that constantly kiss the other cell. And this is probably an efferin mediated touch break, touch break. But if you freeze this at any one time, there are hundreds of little protrusions connecting the ray. Yes? Uh, so the fluorescent image, uh, what are the green and uh, red stands for? Uh, this is actually the same fluorophore. We just colored the planes differently. Oh, okay. And they're, eight, yeah, yeah, they're five true. micrometers apart. But you, you got a huge color palette, especially in the mouse now. You can make, you can target, this is a membrane targeted thing. It's a, a, a GAP43 GFP. You can use other ones that are targeted to the membrane. Uh, we use Moesin GFP to target the uh, cytoskeleton. I'll show you that in just a second. <coughs> so in all these processes, all, seems to be all about uh, cells. But when do they start to secrete the extracellular matrix? Ah. Uh. <laughs> This is imaging the matrix by putting a non-function function blocking antibody that's tagged in there. And so as the fibrils are assembled, this is Lance's work, with, uh, stuff that we did with Doug DeSimone. And um, if you put it in and what, and then uh, 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 just put a dose in um, and then uh, wash it out, you got a pulse label. If you leave it in as more fibrils are made, uh, it, the mat thickens, that's fibronectin. And you can see that they're tugging on the fibronectin as well. So here, we've got the fibronectin in red, the cells in green. Here, the deep parts of the cells are in green, fibronectin in red, and then the protrusive activity of the same outfit is over here in red. So we sometimes will image four or five different levels and make the planes all different. So they also secret collagen at this stage? Hmm? They also uh, make collagen in this stage? Uh, not yet, not yet. They will, at the end of this movie, they'll be making collagen. Yeah, and this, this, uh, these fibrils, they depend upon tension to be made. And the fibronectin signaling through integrins has to happen for the cells to polarize. Um, and there's an experiment that uh, Doug D. Simone, Tanya uh, uh, Rosario in Doug's lab, Basically, they inhibited fibril formation. And the bottom line is that the fibrils, they argue, are not necessary for intercalation. Uh, the signaling is. So the fibronectin has to be there, but it doesn't have to make fibrils. Let me rush on. You won't be able to intercalate uh, uh, as long as they're in the center part here where the uh, the, the axis is reversed, but the positional values are the same. But out here where the positional values are mismatched, the cells always turn anterior toward the anterior value and posterior toward posterior. Uh, and so they'll actually turn completely 90 degrees and converge and extend this way here and this way here. Uh, this is something that Caroline Fornoy in the lab did. We don't know what kind of signal they're reading here, but it, uh, and you can do offsets and get them to bend one way you do it with offset this way, they bend this way, you do an offset in the other direction, they turn the other way. And so they're, and they do, they start within 20 minutes to turn after you put this thing together, it mismatched. So anyway, they seem to be following some sort of local signal and we're trying to figure out what it is. <laughs>
Uh, let me get into cytoskeleton. Uh, this is just morpholino stuff that shows that myosin 2B is essential for blastopore closure. So if you inhibit myosin 2B, this, these things won't squeeze the blastopore shut. And so basically we're testing the idea that there's this hoop stress around the blastopore. And if you look at the cytoskeleton, normally image with Moise and GFP, you, it's, it, it forms this node and strut thing. Uh, a, a node and cable thing that, also, that uh, nodes move back and forth and these cables contract and, and stretch in the medial-lateral axis. And if you knock down myosin 2, it becomes stretchy retchy. So we think myosin 2A is actually responsible for the contraction and 2B probably is, has, imparts most of the tensile properties. If you really hit it hard, you get something with no cytoskeletal cortical tension at all. It's the blob that ate Cleveland, you know, in the sci-fi movie. Um, it's a, a monster. They have no ability to retract anything. Uh, so that we think generates the force and you can look at other myosin and myosin regulatory outfits um, as Catherine and Paul have been doing. Um, myosin 6, if you inhibit it, we think it attaches things to the membrane because when you inhibit it, it'll block gastrulation and all the actin goes to the center the, toward those nodes. In other words, here's myosin 6, it attaches it to the membrane and cadherins. Uh, you cut, you knock that, this down, the cytoskeleton wind, winds up uh, not being able to attach. And myosin 2A and 2B, we think, is involved in. Uh, this contraction of this cortical cytosine. This is all within two micrometers of the surface of the cell. Um, let's go on here. Okay, this is the part I wanted to get to. So we wanted to test the idea. If this thing actually does develop a hoop stress here, can we measure it? So what we did, we made two sleds, Dave Shook did, out of plastic, put this, um, uh, uh, make a giant sandwich, which normally will converge in extending culture, and it, uh, 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 it will, um, uh, make an, a nervous system that extends this way and a mesendoderm system that will extend this way and it'll pull in from the edges. And so this is the axis of the intercalation. It will tow the sleds and so we put a cleat on here uh, with a fiber optic probe, let it pull on the fiber optic probe which is calibrated and we measure the force and this is how it, uh, 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 what it does, it actually generates a lot of force through gastrulation and, and much more later on during neurulation when it pushes the neural folds up. You knock down myosins, you get the same shape, but uh, uh, it's knocked down. This is a control animal cap. Let me just uh, go on. Uh, there's another mechanism that we found by looking at the force traces. Um, we used to think that there was another mechanism down here besides convergent. Uh, extent, uh, convergence uh, and extension that developed a hoop stress and that was convergent thickening and if you ventralize this guy this embryo uh, make it all ventral uh, you get something that looks like this it, it shows this convergent thickening all the way around um, and later we found out that that actually occurs the convergent thickening is always occurring all the way around a normal embryo it's not like this at all and so uh, this force alone is able, able to close the blastopore in a ventralized embryo, but it does so symmetrically. And the way it works, it, it'll generate force too, um, as much actually in, in uh, gastrulation as normally, but after gastrulation, it doesn't do the later rise of up to about four or five micronewtons that the other, the convergent extension does. And so this, it turns out, this is convergent thickening. The thing just very quickly hammers in like this and thickens up. And then uh, you'll notice that things bulge out here. Well, that's because the basis of this is that the epithelium here loses its affinity for the deep layer and this just thickens up by surface tension, tissue surface tension. And then when convergence and extension occurs, it reanneals, the epithelium reanneals to allow this thing to extend itself and uh, generate more surface area. Um, um, so this is convergent thickening and then it f feeds right into convergent extension. So there are two mechanisms there. Um, and this is just sort of more movies of it. You see how the deep layer bulges out there because it's not attached anymore and then the epithelium reanneals with it during convergent extension. This is another control for other things. This is a kind of assay. We talked about differential adhesion and affinity.
Um, we think this, this, this region right here is, is of low affinity and you can see what happens. It just wrinkles up. And over here, watch this part right here. It, it can't hang on to this. And very often it moves back off of it and you'll see another example of that here. Here it's wadding up. Watch this. This thing here, there's the boundary right there and it spreads on the NIMZ but not on the IMZ that does the convergent thickening. So there's a real strong tissue affinity thing here. Um, basically the epithelium turns loose of the deep layer and then the deep layer wants to round up. And here's another example. You see how, here's the boundary, watch how nicely it follows the boundary. It does not like, the epithelium at this stage does not like this tissue. And it's because this tissue is the one that changes. This is another example of tissue affinity. You see how this stuff goes out like that, trying to engulf this piece and then it reverses. And when we, uh, when it's not dorsalized, it can't pull that off. Let me see what's how we're doing on time. Just one more thing. That's all diagrams about how this works. Let's skip this. Want to get to one more thing that I think you'll like. EMT. This is a frog, this is an axolotl. This is a uridial. Notice how the blastopores behave differently? Until we started making movies of this, nobody actually knew that this blastopore wasn't at all like that one. And basically what happens here is, I talked about the hoop stress around here in the frog, it's all done by cell, cell intercalation. And it's the same in the axolotl in the notochord. But the somatic mesoderm here, what happens to it, there's a subduction zone here. This right here is like a bilateral primitive streak, like a chicken or a mouse. And what happens is EMT occurs right there at that zone and basically just eats this entire epithelial sheet here. Um, and uh, you, you generate a hoop stress by intercalation up here and then by removal of this whole sector here. And if I'll show you how that works. Let's go on to the punchline here. There's the epithelium. Notice how the apical constriction happens. Disappears underneath the endoderm here, which is isolated in an explant, so it's moving this way. Normally this sheet moves under the endoderm. And here it is in fluorescence. Here they are as an epithelium. Here they undergo the EMT, and here they're bubbling up underneath the layer as a mesenchyme. So what this does is basically it pulls this whole thing in. Let's get past this. I want to show you the force measurements. Uh, what happens is there's the zone, there's the endoderm, and here's the epithelium that's going to be uh, undergo apical constriction and then ingression right here. When it does so, it would just tow this epithelium toward that static point there where it's stuck. And then they bubble out as the epithelium. You can set this up with the tractor pull mechanism and you can measure the force and it generates about as much force as cell intercalation. It's uh, rock dependent, in other words, myosin dependent, um, and we've characterized it in various ways. Now, a trick about this is it's progressive. It's progressive from anterior to posterior and from lateral uh, uh, to medial. Um, and here's the burn of EMT in a situation where the cells can't go anywhere. So they, because they can't go anywhere, they just undergo EMT and bubble around on the surface as a mesenchyme. And so this is a wave that passes across the tissue. And it's essential that it be that way because it has to tow this stuff down. So you don't want it happening all at the same time everywhere. Um, you want it on a zone. And so basically this animal has a bilateral primitive streak. Um, and the whole process of EMT is patterned the same way with the same underlying mechanism as the MIB. This is the pattern of expression of the MIB in Xenopus that generates the hoop stress. The progression of EMT is actually the same. So the underlying patterning mechanism seems to be the same, or at least it's got the same geometry, but it winds up uh, the, the driving two completely different e uh, uh, cell biological processes. Same hoop stress. Same hoop stress. That's it. I won't do the rest of it.
I'll just give it to you. You guys can play. It. So you you can be wrong during break then. <laughs>